All right. This is Donna from the Everything Saxophone Podcast. I am so happy. I'd love to welcome Rick Margitza to the Everything Saxophone Podcast. He is a legend, and he has something new that just came out that hit the saxophone world literally by storm. <laughs> okay. So, Rick, welcome to the Everything Saxophone Podcast. Hi, Donna. Thank you so much for having me. He is such a legend. Um, I want, I want if people don't know who you are, I want them to get to know you. So can we talk about, aside from the fact that you work with people like Miles Davis and, so, and stuff, we'll get into that, but hmm. can we talk about how you started in music and then how you started playing saxophone and stuff like that? When did you first start playing instruments? Uh, sure. I, um, I come from a very musical family. Uh, our origin is Eastern European Gypsy. Uh, so we're Romani, R-O-M-A-N, uh, or Roma is how we're referred to these days. And my father's side is from Budapest, and my mother's side is from Czechoslovakia. So uh, my great-grandparents all came over before the war, um, and they're all musicians. And um, well, my father's a classical violinist. I grew up in Detroit. So he's a violinist. Um, he was with the Detroit Symphony orchestra for about 30 years and his father my paternal grandfather was a hungarian gypsy violinist uh, and he's the one who taught me how to play the violin at the age of around four just learning teaching me these little kind of hungarian folk songs so i got introduced to music that way but also hearing my father play classical music in the house and uh, he was also one of the string players who was the nucleus of the people that they used on all the Motown recordings from the Detroit, from the Detroit Symphony. So uh, when you, whenever you hear all that old Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder, Diana Ross, that's, my father is one of the violins. So that was a really cool heritage to kind of be part of. Oh, my so God. I grew up here. Yeah. Yeah. So I grew up hearing all of that music in the house. And then my mother's father, my paternal, maternal grandfather, he played bass with Glenn Miller, but he also played cello on Charlie Parker with strings. So at the beginning of Just Friends, the cello solo was actually my grandfather. So I grew up hearing jazz through my mom. Uh, so there's all this different type of music going on in the house without any labels. So it was just kind of there. So I kind of really didn't have a choice. Um, <laughs> So I played violin for a couple of years, just fooling around. Um, I got serious with music. Um, I guess around nine or 10, I started studying classical piano. So that was my really my, my first uh, experience with studying and learning how to read music and all that stuff. Um, and then I joined the, you know, when you got into junior high, um, you had to pick an instrument to play uh, because there's no piano. There's no orchestra at that point. So uh saxophones weren't available yet because oh. i had heard some charlie parker in the house um but I, so i got an oboe and a clarinet and my mom said you want to hear really what an oboe sounds like on, re on a recording so she put on the bird the strings and when i really heard bird that at that point that's kind of what flipped the switch for me um oh. and i had a cousin who was a little older older than me um and she was really into Chuck Mangione, and at that point, her saxophone player was Jerry Nywood, oh who gosh. is one of my all-time favorite hero main influences. Uh, his melodic style and swing and sound and intonation just made a huge imprint on me. And then she also turned me into the Brecker Brothers. So that was, you know, so it was Michael, Jerry Nywood, and Coltrane, and then... Uh, and bird of course <laughs> oh my gosh this is such a rich musical history keep going <laughs> yeah uh so uh throughout junior high and high school i played in the in the stage band and i started studying classical saxophone with donald sinta who was the main guy at university of michigan for years so that's kind of how i got my classical kind of control and breathing and in altissimo kind of stuff seeds planted by him. But throughout high school, I was playing along with records and just learning solos that way. And then I started kind of getting serious about writing them out. But um, it was really for me, it was just I could not wait to get home and go downstairs and turn on the records and just learn, um, you know, play along with bird solos and whatever Michael Brecker I could. And Super Sax at the time was kind of a big thing. 
Oh my gosh. Uh, and all the Jerry and I would stuff with Chuck, early Chuck Mangione. Um, and uh, can I interrupt yeah. for one second? This of is, course. This, yeah. oh, this is incredible. So do you feel, I mean, let's, let's backtrack this for a second. When you first started on any instruments, the violin, it sounds like you were taught by ear, not necessarily mm -hmm. Suzuki, right? Not necessarily Suzuki, but you were no, learning right. your heritage, your culture, you know, folk songs and that kind of thing. How do you think that that impacted you as you started to learn the other instruments and as you started to learn classical music? How do you think that impacted you? Uh, the learning by ear part, you yeah. mean, or yeah. uh, well, the, the the piano not as much because at that point it was serious kind of studying and you know reading and learning how to read music and decipher all that stuff. But in terms of learning jazz, um, and that's why I say to almost all of my students is. Uh, you have to play along with records to imitate what's happened before you and to really pay attention to all the details in terms of phrasing and time feel and in, you know, inflection. Because I made the mistake at first when I was first starting is I was just worried about the notes, um, but I wasn't paying enough attention to all the details. So um, I kind of equate it with, you know, I'm living in, in I've been living in, Paris for 20 years now and I learned the language but I didn't learn the accent so it sounds really horrible they can understand me but I have no inflection right. so it's like that's that's why I, I say when you play along with records and learn solos pay attention to the vibrato or lack of vibrato the scooping all the articulation all that stuff is really where the beauty of the language and the detail um, is really important. So, uh, yeah, I think kind of starting and learning to play by ear is something that made it, the music come in a different way than just by looking at it on the page. Can I ask, this is a, a great course. tip. Thank you so much for that. Tip. Mm -hmm. Can I ask too, though, that, okay, so when you first started putting albums on and stuff like that, records on, I mean, you weren't necessarily aware of inflection at that point, or were you? when you were doing this as a young child? Well, um, yes, I think I was because especially, I learned a couple of bird solos, but they were a little bit maybe beyond my technical capability at the time. So I was just learning to play along with them at half speed. And when you're playing along with them at half speed, you can get even deeper into the articulation. That's true. And, and then learning all the Jerry Nywood solos, I was really trying to imitate that sound and his vibrato and the intonation. So without realizing what I was doing, I was paying attention to all those details. That's great. And that's, yeah. that's a great tip. And it's, it's that, it's that next step. You know, it's not just about, of course, the notes and the rhythms are important, but uh, I love the analogy that you used where, you know, if you're learning a second language, if you don't, if you don't have the right inflection, um, if you're not speaking, let's see, how do I want to word this? Basically, you could be cursing somebody out if you don't have mm -hmm. the right <laughs> emphasis on mm -hmm. certain, you know, certain um, uh, characteristics of the the words that you're saying. I think that's a that's a great analogy. I, I'm sorry to interrupt that. I just had to I had to dig into that at that point. So no, 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 not at all. I, I, yeah, that analogy of thinking about learning it, learning a language, and the notes and the phrases are like the the letters and the words and the sentences, but the inflection and time feel and all that other stuff is the accent and the music of the language. And you know what, too, even if we we can take this one step further, not even mm -hmm. just a second language, I like to always say, think about the greatest speakers, right? The greatest public speakers, and I always refer to like Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you think about, he's not just speaking in a monotone. You know, what is he doing with, with what, how is he expressing his message? You know, he's speeding up, he's slowing down, he's, he's emphasizing like an accent. He's, absolutely, he's getting higher, he's getting lower. Um, pausing? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's the same thing. And, you know, um, and, and that's something that everybody can, can relate to. Compared to, let's say, the teacher that we all had in high school who talks in a monotone like this and oh, we're sitting man. there and we've got a massive yes. test the next day. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's torture. Yes. I think we've all had several of those. Yeah. yeah and, and painful. Hardest subjects, right? Mm -hmm. you know, 
most grade point, most things that affect your grade point average or whatever. But um, I'm so glad that you're saying this in this way, because this is something that that is such a mindset flip for a lot of people who are so focused on like the notes and notes and notes. But it's it's something I mean, Greg Fishman had talked about this, you know, with me on the podcast and when I've spoken to him, too. But it's it's great hearing it from you as well, because there's so much more to it. There's so much more to it when you're, you know, you're learning the language of jazz. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So now um, going back, so like junior high, high school, right? You're putting these these records on. At first, you're learning them by ear. Then, you know, I guess it took a while later. You said, maybe I'll write some of this stuff down, all that kind of thing. Yeah, when I started, it was uh, junior high was mainly Bird and Jerry and I would and um, some early Michael, but it wasn't until high school that I got fluent enough to start really trying to tackle some of this stuff. And that's when I started writing out the solos. Got it. And at that point, I actually just liked collecting them because I liked to see the stack of papers getting bigger. So it was just that seeing the seeing the progress. Um, uh, yeah, so that's kind of when I started getting more into writing everything out. And, you know, I um, well, a couple of things. I, I called it the white Jewish tenor school. So I got into D Dave Liebman, Bob Berg, Michael Brecker, Steve Grossman, and uh, Bob Mincer. And even though he's not Jewish, it's like Berganzi, I kind of put in that group because those six guys all came from this certain generation and they all picked up a little different part of Coltrane. Mm. And it's, uh, I think it's a, just it'd be a fascinating sociological, like a dissertation about how these six white guys in New York at a certain point in time all drew inspiration from Coltrane and then branched off and did their own individual things. But so I got into those guys before I really got into Wayne and Joe and Sonny. Um, I kind of got into the, the black guys afterwards. Um, it just happened that way. Yeah. yeah um, uh, and I, luckily I had a band director in high school. His name was Jack Pearson who had played a little piano with Cannonball Adderley and had some, experience in the jazz world and he turned me on to Lenny Tristano and Warren Marsh and the Konitz and he's he planted a huge seed uh in my head about not playing cliches okay and when you think about how yeah when you think about how how Warren Marsh plays how he's really a true improviser and really doesn't play licks per se um so that thing about always trying to play and trying to discover something that's your own and not repeat yourself and don't play cliches was planted in my subconscious at a really early age. So that is still kind of informs my choices, I would say. Let's talk, let's dive into this because this, this mm. is a really important topic, I think. Um, some people would argue that you, you have to, <clears throat> you have to play licks because that's the language right can you talk about that yes well so the the only negative thing about being his name was jack pearson the only negative thing about him about being around him was that he was so into that that he didn't really talk about the blues and the language itself he was talking about it's more it was more than more of an intellectual thing so it took me a while to get back to the other side of it because when I teach and I talk about music now, I say you have to absorb all the traditional language and be able to play it, but choose not to or find a way to disguise it. So it's really important to have all that stuff underneath, because if you don't and you could hear it when you hear even when you hear, of course, when you hear Warren Marsh, you could hear that he has all that Lester Young stuff there. It's just that he he developed his own voice as a result of absorbing all the other stuff. So um, yeah, I think it's completely necessary to have all that stuff um, as kind of your underlying syntax of your language. Can you talk about in go? You just said this like a couple of times. You know, own voice, developing your own voice. How how do you teach your students to develop their own voice? Yeah, that's that's a tough one. I mean, the kind of the the in the book, the method and what I talk about shows how you could 
or how I develop whatever you would call maybe my own style as a result of taking something that you transcribed from Charlie Parker or Coltrane and then transforming it. So when I, it's, it's tough talking about teaching. It's like you, I could teach them what I do and how I did it. And hopefully that will inspire them to find their own way. So there's a little, it's a fine line between teaching them to play like you, which ultimately you want to do, but inspire them to, to kind of find their own way as a result of them seeing how I did my thing. I don't know if that makes sense or not. I think so. And, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about an analogy of, okay, like, in, like classes in high school, English <clears throat> literature, and, Oof. you know, let's say you're reading, um, let's say Dostoevsky that just came to mind. I, I was mm -hmm. actually, I also wanted to say Albert Camus, right? You're listening, you're reading all these great authors and then you have to talk about, you know, yeah, what was the book about? Of course, but going beyond that, and and taking a concept from there and equating it with you know um, like current events or or how it affects you or you know what I'm saying I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not wording this very well but I'm just trying to think about an analogy I'll probably get better with this as I think more about it this is the first time I'm thinking about it but like taking English literature or whatever your native language is and a very popular piece of of literature even if it's Stephen King right you know. Mm -hmm. um, and and taking you know the the work of that and, and what is how is that work affecting you, and put, what's your message from that? Yeah, um, I was talking about that about language and with a friend of mine, and we were talking about stand up comedians and how in in what we're doing playing music, it's much easier to get away with taking something from somebody. Um, and kind of even even playing the same thing, which in so it, I, I I don't know who this phrase is attributed to, but they say in literature it's plagiarism, in music it's influence. Wow! So you can't really just you can't really take another stand-up's joke and 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 use it, even if you change a couple words because it's so obvious. But in music, you could take something that they could say, oh yeah, that's definitely coming from Bird, but for me, the balance is play something that's familiar enough, but not to the point where it's boring because they heard it played in a much better way. Right. I don't want to hear somebody play like bird if I can hear bird play, but if I hear somebody playing like bird, but also with some new twists and turns, then it's like, all right, this guy has examined the language enough to come up with something that makes me say, what is that? That would, like I, I want to hear that again so I can figure it out or that inspires me. So um that's gold. That's gold yeah. right there. I love the way you said that. And it's and and you know the the thing that I like to think about too. Yeah, Bird played that already. Coltrane played that already. Learn it. But that's their language, right? That's them. You're not them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> who are you? You know, that that's the thing. You have to find who you are. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to go in left field for one second here, too. We're, you know, we're talking about jazz, all that kind of thing. But, you know, people aren't playing. The jazz has evolved so much, you know, um, not only in the last 50 years, but honestly, really in the last 10, you know, yeah. and, and how we, we are improvising over popular music, right? So... There are a lot of people that feel, oh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to learn jazz. I want to be my own person. I don't feel like I need to learn that. I don't know if you've come across that with some of your students. I doubt it. But if you have, you know, what would you say to somebody like that? Um, yeah, I have. Um, oh. And I, if I hear somebody, a younger player, I could almost tell if they haven't absorbed enough of the language, it's like, what's a little, I can imagine it's, it's a little kind of um, overwhelming. If you think about being a young player today, as opposed to an older player like me, they have 20 years more language to absorb in a way. Yeah. 
I don't know if that makes sense because I, I, I should have also absorbed the 20 years that I'm talking about, but they have to go back to where I started, but also absorb all the stuff that came after me. Yeah. So it's a, it's, it's a lot to take in, but you know, I, when I hear somebody play, I can tell if they've only checked out Grossman, but not checked out Coltrane, for example. And if they've only checked out train on impulse as opposed to train on prestige, then Atlantic, then impulse. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's funny how you said that in my thought, I was thinking someone growing up today, I'm also thinking about the overwhelm of instant access to things. Whereas when we were growing up, we didn't have that at all. <laughs> no, it's, it is, yeah, it's, it's, it's extraordinary what you have available to you, but it's also overwhelming. Um, I just went on YouTube to search one little thing. I found myself, I was there like two hours later going and I found this and I found this, but then I forgot that I wanted to listen to this at the beginning. And it's like, you know, my joke is on, on your phone, you can now have the complete recordings of everybody. <laughs> they can complete everything. Yeah. And, 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 and it's great, but it, it's just, it's, it's, yeah, it's just overwhelming. It's mind boggling. And um, it can be, it could be a distraction and, and, you know, again, you're teaching younger people, you know, younger people, I'm talking like, you know, college and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing the effects of that, I think, too. Yeah. Um, I, there's a whole young, younger generation of players that you could tell, and this is not a, a pejorative thing, but you can tell that they've started at Mark Turner and Chris Potter. Like that's that's their new guys as opposed to us when it was Brecker and and, and yeah. Grossman. Um, and I guess that's just kind of a natural thing. But there's something, and I'm being being very general here, that is lacking when I hear that because they haven't gone back far enough. And they, even Michael Brecker, he he told me he said, and and I've I've read where he said, "Don't listen to me. Listen to the guys that I listen to." Yeah. Yeah. And that's what you tell, I'm sure that's what you tell your students, you know, uh, to do. And it's probably, I remember, and I've mentioned this a couple of times in the podcast, I took um, a, a jazz history course with Antonio Hart at Queens College many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, Antonio's awesome. And mm -hmm. opened, you know, I was listening to jazz a lot, but he really opened my eyes to other people I never even thought of listening to, you know, um, on saxophone and other instruments as well. Mm -hmm. And it can, it can it's it's funny people are sometimes reticent to do that but if you do that and sometimes it could really open your eyes and your ears to other sounds and other ideas that you normally you wouldn't you wouldn't have thought of you don't know what you don't know absolutely talking. absolutely yeah well the whole other other instrument thing um yeah you have to check out if you're even if you're a sax if you're any musician you have to check out herbie you have to check out keith you have to check out your career no matter what instrument you play um but if you're a drummer you should know about woody shaw you know but if you're a saxophone player you should also know about the history of the drums it's uh, it's really easy to get tunnel vision but i think uh, when you get that narrow it 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 closes you off to like you were just saying to a lot of different other beautiful things that are out there and yeah. let alone classical music and world music and i mean oh, yeah. there's that's it is overwhelming but yeah you know what and and you know this is cool because I'm, I'm going in a lot of different directions i wasn't expecting and that's awesome and i'm just thinking mm -hmm. what you just said like world music and stuff you mentioned you moved to paris 20 years ago but i you know i have um students in europe um i've interviewed a lot of european people on the podcast I find in Europe, it's more, it's even more eclectic. There's a lot more cultural music, world music uh, influence. And, you know, when people are, are, are forming bands or, or, or whatever the case may be, um, it's not like they're just playing jazz standards. It's, it's, it's a, this whole mix of different mm -hmm. cultures. I find it really interesting. I, I'm sure you've obviously found that too. And, and you know, some of the bands that you're, you're in right now. Yeah, that's that's definitely part of, of of the culture here, and but that's also something that kind of started um, in the seventies. You know, with the Dave Liebman's band, Lookout Farm, and the Mahavishnu band, and all that stuff. That was kind of, they were starting to draw influences from different types of music, 
Yeah, um, right. But I think that's even a bigger part of what's going on now because there are just more people that are into it and um, social you know, media. the whole odd, the whole odd, odd meter thing is really a huge influence. Uh, I mean, just talking about things that I haven't absorbed. I mean, I'm overwhelmed when I hear how fluently some of these younger people can play in odd meters and I never have really spent a lot of time doing it. So that's something I'm kind of uh, really shy about because I haven't spent time working on it. And so. that's, I think that's an American thing though. I really do because, because even, you know, even if you're into jazz and stuff, the, the popular culture here, it's four, four time. Rarely yeah. do you hear something in triple meter, you know, it's right. mostly a double yeah. meter type of thing. And we're, <laughs> We're so stuck in that, and it's it's um, when you have something in like a seven eight or you know whatever it may be, it 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 throws you, uh, you know you like it, but you won't know what to do with it. Yeah, yeah. And for me, I get overwhelmed because I think I've spent all this time practicing all my stuff in four four for the last thirty or forty years. Do I have to now practice everything in five and in seven? <laughs> it's like <laughs> that's it's overwhelming. So. <laughs> Well, with your students, so let me ask you this question. Um, with your students, are you starting to have them appreciate and start to, to listen to music that is in odd meters? No, because I don't really know enough about it, but they actually will bring stuff in to me. Um, so I'm learning some, and we play through some of it because of some of the arrangements they bring in. Bring in. So it's more kind of from them instead of me bringing it to them because it's something that's part of their their culture these days and that's cool and you know and it also again a, a great teacher learns from the students as well you know this is a perfect example absolutely, absolutely. yeah so now now i'm going to go back because we kind of mm. jumped around but that's awesome because that's where the conversation mm. took us so you know high school doing all these types of things you knew you knew you were going to go into music at that point uh, yes, I, I kind of never, like I said, with my family and just being around it, and I, I kind of never had a choice. I was never forced on me. I, 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 I really could, couldn't wait for school to be over so I can go home and start practicing and go down and start listening to the records and all that stuff. Um, so I finished high school, and like I said, I had this great teacher who was who knew a lot about the music, and he, you know, he, he told me about Coltrane and, like I said, the Warren Mars stuff. So. I was really fortunate in that respect. Um, and his son, his name is Matt Pearson, who's a producer. And his name will come into the story a little later. So anyway, uh, I um, finished high school in Detroit. I went to Wayne State University for a year, which is in Detroit. And um, at the end of that first year, we went to the Montreux Festival. We did a, a little tour of Europe. My first time ever being, you know, out of the country with, with my friends and the big band from the school. So it was an amazing, cool. an amazing experience. And um, when looking at the schedule of where we were going to play, we noticed that the Brecker brothers were going to be there. Mm. So oh. I had a friend named Simon Austin, trumpet player, and we were both Michael Brecker freaks. So I went with all my solos of his that I had transcribed. And I was just carrying him around in my backpack, hoping to meet him while, while we were there. This is it in Montreux, Switzerland. So literally one afternoon, we were walking down the street and I said, Simon, and because I saw him coming down the street towards us. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so I just stopped him and I just looked up. I said, Mr. Brecker, I have these. And he looked at them, and he, I mean, he has such a great sense of humor. He looked at them and said, he said, wow, you're really into this shit, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, if you're free tomorrow afternoon, why don't you come up to my room for a lesson? I didn't even ask him. He asked me to come up and hang out. And there was never any mention of like, and I charged this. It was just come up and we'll hang for a couple hours or whatever. And that's how I met him and started my my relationship with him. And it was, you know. I was in heaven. I mean, it was extraordinary just to have him be that kind to me. Um, and um, yeah, he was always a big supporter and a fan. And, you know, I was really fortunate to have known him that way. Can I ask what, if you can remember, I'm sure you can, <laughs> what was <laughs> one big piece of advice 
tip that he gave you during that that lesson? Well, uh, he taught me a couple alternate fingerings that I was curious about. Um, and he talked about, um, we actually played, we traded courses along with the Abrasol blues and I have a recording of it somewhere. Wow. And he talked about what I, what the, what he talked about the melodic minor scale, but what he called it was the Lydian augmented scale, because at that point coming from India, Indiana university, the, they, they talked about the melodic minor in terms of that scale. That's interesting. Yeah. So in, like, so it would be the, uh, the third mode of melodic minor. Yeah. So C melodic minor, he refers to that as E flat Lydian augmented. Wow. Okay. But how he said that when you learn how to how to use the melodic minor scale, um, he called it Lydian augmented. He said the day I learned how that scale works was the day that the Earth shook. <laughs> and years before, there was an old bebop player in Detroit who was self-taught and he told me once you could play minor over everything and i didn't really know what he meant at the time but now i discovered what he meant is by using the different modes of melodic minor you could play over every chord type okay that's that's very interesting right so c minor over c minor but c minor over b7 gives you b7 altered but you're still just hearing c minor instead of thinking sharp nine flat nine sharp five flat five which makes it so much easier and it actually gives you much more of a melodic flow because you're just hearing that minor sound over a different root mm. so c minor over a gives you a half diminished right 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 c minor over f gives you f lydian dominant oh wow okay yeah now, for those people that are listening that are like, oh, my God, all this theory, my head's going to explode. Um, <laughs> here's, here's the thing, you know, you uh, and, and this is this is what I always say too. you learn the theory that you need when, when you're ready, you're going to be ready to learn it. You know, um, mm -hmm. so if all this like Lydian augmented, all this kind of thing is, is too much for you, that's OK. Um, it's going to depend on the style of music that you want, you know, you want to play. Um, you know, for the most part. So don't, don't totally tune us out. Okay. Cause this is, <laughs> this actually is pretty fascinating uh, when you think about it, but for some of you, it may not apply and that's perfectly fine. Right. I could simplify it and just say, you only need two scales at first. You need a major scale and melodic minor scale. And those 14 modes, right? Seven major modes, seven melodic minor modes cover every chord type that you'll come across in almost any type of standard tune that you're going to come across um, and then of course diminished scales whole tone all that stuff those are added for extra color but if you just learn those 14 modes and or those two scales um you're going to be good to go now so that's, that's, for, really... <laughs> th that's for people that are into you know playing jazz and playing you know playing the standards but also playing more the modern jazz but what what would mm -hmm. you say um like I, I've definitely, you know, heard one scale obviously is your major scales. You got to know your major scales and stuff. I've not mm -hmm. heard as the melodic minor being this, like a second choice. But if you have someone that's just totally into like blues or even, you know, um, rock or pop or all that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I don't know if you have stu students that are that are just into that. What would you say would be like the two scales or whichever scales that they should be into? Um, major scales, obviously, and a pentatonic scale. Got it. Right. So the C major pentatonic could also be thought of as A minor pentatonic. Yes. Right. So that pentatonic scale, will you can play just that scale over blues and, and succeed. <laughs> right. It's, it's, it's improvising. It's not, it may not have dissonance to it. That's the only problem with it. But, you know, um, it's it, you definitely need to learn that scale just to start with. Right, and in certain situations, you don't want to, you don't want dissonance, you know, because I, I lived in New Orleans for a while and I played on a, a blues band on Bourbon Street, and um, yeah, there was no room for dissonance. It just, it's, it's not. 
it's not part of the music. Right. I like the way you said that there's no room for dissonance. <laughs> <laughs> That's very cool. Yeah, because some music, you know, you have to think about you have to think about what that music is and, and the audience, you know, and right. like, what sure. is that? <laughs> exactly. That's awesome. And right, so let's let yeah, let's continue on. So you went to Wayne State, you met Michael Brecker. Awesome story. Right. Okay. So what what, uh, what happened after? Um, so I took once the next semester off. Um, I had a friend from Detroit who had gone to Berkeley and he told me that it was a really cool school. So I decided to try that. I went for one semester. So this would have been like the the second half of the year. I went to Berkeley like in January. So for the second semester, basically, uh, this would have been, I guess, 1981. Um, didn't get that much at that point out of being in the school, but it was the first time I was really living away from home and playing and jamming all the time. And there were all these international musicians. Uh, Dave Kokoski was also there at the same time. Um, uh, Jeff Watts. Uh, there's a nucleus of players that were around there. And it was the first time I heard Jerry Berganzi live and Bob Berg live. So it was just a really fertile period. Um, and I grew a lot there. Um, maybe not necessarily because I was at the school, but just because I was in that environment. The people. Yeah. yeah. The people. So then from there, I, um, I, like I said, I liked the city, but I wasn't really enamored with the school so much. So at this, this point, Matt Pearson, who is the son of my band director, <clears throat> was going to school at the University of Miami. And he told me, you should come down here and check it out. It was a great program. So that's when I went to University of Miami through Matt's recommendation and met another amazing group of musicians and some incredible teachers that really shaped a lot of my musical thought. One of them being Gary Campbell, who is the saxophone teacher there, who practice method is something that I took and kind of expanded a little bit. And that's kind of the first chapter of, of the book is how I practice. And that came basically from being around Gary and Gary was at school with Michael Brecker Indiana, so they practice together. So Michael also credits Gary a lot in terms of um, his musical thought and how he practiced. So, wow, Gary's an important important figure. It's it's amazing how small of a world this is when you think about it. All these connections. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> how this how this stuff is happening. So the effects of Gary Campbell, and we're going to talk about um, your book, three hundred sixty five days to practice in a second. I want to get a little bit more of a mm -hmm. history. Um, leading up to that, so that's awesome. So you 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 um, you know you studied under Gary Campbell. It really influenced you amongst other people that were there. And then what mm -hmm. happened uh, after that point? Uh, all right. So I was in Miami for two semesters for a year, basically. And while I was there, some relatives of mine from Detroit called me and said they were going to New Orleans. They just got a call through connection to work at the new Sheraton hotel that just opened up down there playing kind of jazz in the lobby, but it was six nights a week. We would have free rooms at the hotel and basically playing jazz all day. I mean, it wasn't like people sitting on listening to us, but you know, some people would, but it was more kind of lobby jazz, but playing standards. So I definitely wanted to do that. Uh, so I left school, moved to new Orleans, uh, that job lasted for about six months, but I fell in love with the city mm. and met some amazing musicians there and just the, the food and the architecture and the, the feeling of the drummers down there just kind of really just captured me. So I ended up staying there for almost five years. Got it. And at that point, I was pretty close to graduating. So I went to Loyola University for one more year, transferred all my credits and finally got a degree. Got it. Which um, I guess is good just to say that I graduated, but it hasn't really meant that much, I guess. Other than, of course, going through the different schools and meeting all the people and everything, that was a great experience. The piece of paper doesn't really matter that much. Um, it's the people. It's the connections. Yeah, it's absolutely, absolutely the connections that you made, for sure. Yeah. And the, the, I always, of course, in the back of my mind was thinking I want to go to New York because that's where the center of everything is. And 
that was just, I, I knew that that's what I had to do. Um, but because I, I stayed in New Orleans for five years, I moved to New York a little later than I wanted to, but in a way it was good because a lot of the people from University of Miami and Berkeley who I knew moved to New York. So I moved there already having some connections and instead of moving into a scene where I didn't know anybody. Got it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going through this history kind of quickly, but anyway, so when I was in my, when I was in New Orleans, Matt Pearson, the, trumpet player, son of my band director, he had already moved to New York and got a job as an intern at Blue Note Records. Oh, okay. So he was working just there, just, you know, interning, and he wrote me and said, send me a demo tape because I could get it to Bruce Lundball, who was the president of the company at the time. Uh, so I went in, recorded a couple of my tunes, put some live stuff from different gigs I'd done on a cassette tape and sent it to Matt. Matt played it for Bruce and Bruce said, let's do a record with this guy. That's awesome. So I really got, you know, that, that phrase, it's not what you know, but who you know. Um, yeah. You know, obviously the tape, there was something on there that was good, but if it wasn't for Matt getting it to Bruce, who knows if that would have happened or not. But Ma Matt, without me knowing, also sent the tape to Tommy Lacuma, who was in the studio recording the Amandla record with Miles. Wow. So I'm still in New Orleans at the time and I get a call from Tommy and said, he said, Rick, uh, I'm sorry it took so long. The tape was sitting around in the, in, in the studio and I finally listened to it and it's, it's amazing. And he said, I just called Miles and I played it for him over the phone. And Miles told me to tell you that you have a job. Wow, that's, that's, oh my gosh, this is so incredible. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so yeah, I'm still living in New York, and I mean, living in New Orleans, and Tom, Tommy also said, it's too bad you signed with Blue Note, and I said, well, I didn't sign a contract yet, so he said, well, then great, let's talk about getting you over to Warner Brothers. So, I mean, I was, I guess, 25 or 26 at this point. I hadn't even moved to New York and I had these two major record labels kind of bidding against me and I got the gig with Miles and um, yeah, luckily I was, it didn't go to my head. It was just still about the music. So I kind of, I don't even really, a lot of it, I don't even remember what I, what my experience was other than just, you know, um, thinking I better keep my shit together because I have to, I have to, you know, I have to, to put up or shut up kind of thing. Wow. Yeah. Miles um, Davis. <clears throat> my gosh. Yeah. So, so Tommy said, Miles wants to meet you. And, um, this, I have no memory of flying to New York, how I got into the city, taking a taxi. Did I know anybody, whatever. I just knew that I had to go to the, Marriott es Essex House, which is where Miles was living, which is a hotel on uh, Central Park South. So I was, of course, terrified. I wasn't sure if he was going to ask me to play or what it was going to be like. Um, and I got to his door and there was a sign. It said, please take off your shoes. So I stood there with my horn and my shoes for about 15 minutes before I got the courage to knock on the door. And I knocked on the door, and I always remember this. He had a pair of leather pants on and no shirt, and he just had this smile on his face, and it felt like I was with my father or something. Wow. And it put me completely at ease, and he just said, come on in. <laughs> and that, it, was, it was that easy, and he just looked for some tapes on his desk. Um, there was a bunch of papers, and so he gave me a couple of cassette, cassette tapes, and he said, I'll see you on stage. So no rehearsal, nothing. Um, luckily, I had seen that show, that incarnation of that band a couple of times where I kind of knew how things were structured. And the first gig was with Kenny Garrett. The idea was to have two saxophone players. Okay. And um, after that concert, Miles actually fainted backstage. He collapsed because uh, he was not in good health. Yeah. Oh my so... Gosh. Um, 
the next day we get down to go on the bus and he said, I'm really sorry, but I, I can't have an extra person on stage right now. It's too much energy for me to think about restructuring the solos and the, the you know, the, the structure of the show. So he said, I'll call you when Kenny leaves. So I basically played one gig with miles and like a couple of days later, I was back in New York and it was like, a little shell shock like what just happened yeah yeah um, i don't think i played that badly but was it that Is it, was it something i did or you know i don't i don't know so um about maybe two months later they're getting ready to do this summer tour and apparently kenny had asked for more money at the last minute and they said no the management said no so he took his stuff at the airport and just left wow so I got the call, um, and I, I, I actually still have the tape someplace from my answering machine, and it was I said, Rick, it's Miles, we need you. Wow. <laughs> so he called me as soon as Kenny left, and I had, I had like a couple of days to get my shit together and meet them, and that's what I did. It was like a six-week tour of Europe in 1989. And... Um, yeah, that was my experience with him. It was it wasn't long enough, unfortunately. I wish, of course, I just wish it would have been longer. But I had that tour because the next tour that started in the states, I had a conflict because I already signed a contract to do something for for my the release of my uh, recording and Blue Note. So I went to him and said, "I'm gonna, I'm going to have to miss the first two gigs." I was terrified of that too, and he said, "Don't worry about it. We'll get." Gary Thomas to cover for you and you just meet us. Um, but in the meantime, Kenny called and said he wanted to come back. Uh, so that's kind of what happened. So uh, that probably would have happened even if I hadn't asked to take off those two days, but you know, I'll never know. Um, but yeah. I had that experience, which of course was uh, life changing. In many ways, can can you talk about how, you know, like, if you can remember, because I'm sure it's like, wow, this is incredible. <laughs> but being on tour, playing with Miles, like, what, you know, um, what was, I guess, the biggest thing you, what the biggest lesson you got out of that? Uh, it's hard to say just one thing, but it was that a point in his career where the band, it wasn't... I'm gonna, how do I say this delicately? It wasn't the greatest musical experience. Oh, okay. being around him was, but it was really structured, and some of the musicians were more kind of like pop players. So I would hear the same drum fills in the same spots, and you know, so it was more of a show. It wasn't like when he first came back, the band with Marcus Miller and Mike Stern, where there was a lot of interaction going on. So. Uh, I was a little disappointed and maybe went in there thinking it was going to be something else. Mm. Uh, so that made me grow up. It's like not everything is what it's going to be, but you have to adapt to whatever it is, whatever it is. So seeing Miles operate within those type of constrictions is what uh, something, uh, probably the biggest lesson is because he still find a, found a way to be creative without getting a lot of back and forth. Yeah. You know, and I also, this, this, this concept of having your own language, because he was not playing different stuff every night. It would sometimes be the same stuff, but always put in different places. So this idea of having things that you use, but the art is where do you use them and how do you place them? Uh, and also, of course, the use of space. Yeah. Because, you know, a lot of the music we were playing were vamps, like one chord kind of stuff that would go on for a while. So it would be his turn to take a solo. And he would walk around the stage because he had a clip on mic for a couple minutes before he even played. And it doesn't seem like a long time, but he created so much drama. Sometimes he would pick up the horn but not play. Mm. So he, all this tension was created, and when he finally played, it was, could have just been one note or two notes, and it was just like, oh. <laughs> God, I'm so, feeling that as you're saying the story. <laughs> yeah. So that 
it, it took me a while to even though I saw that happening. Um, you know, there's there are a couple of videos of me playing and I listen to them and I see them now and I, I cringe because I'm still playing so much. It's like you know, sometimes the 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 energy and the exuberance of youth is overrated. <laughs> so um it's taken me a long time to get to that point where you can control the crowd and the audience and the emotion, the energy of what's happening by not playing or by playing quietly. Um, you know, sometimes when you're playing in a noisy room, you try to play louder to get them to shut up. And I realize that the softer you play, that's how you can get them to pay attention and kind of quiet down. So that can I interject for one second? Of you course. Know, you just reminded me of something. Um, when I was first teaching for music, you know, music teaching, music ed and stuff, one of our professors, Larry Eisman at Queens College, he had said to me, when, when kids are just misbehaving, this was like a junior high school, he said, don't talk loud, don't compete, yeah. talk soft, talk soft, they're going to strain to hear you, they'll naturally mm -hmm. be quiet. And it's so, it is so hard to do that because our tendency is to try to, you know, match and, and you know, overpower and it's it's really hard to constrain yourself, you know, to yeah, restrain yeah. stuff. And he was right, though. He was definitely right. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of power in that silence. So, I, like I said, it's taken me a long time. But just seeing him operate in the use of space and creating drama and tension by not playing and um, knowing what you're playing but placing it deliberately. Um, so we were playing, like, for instance, we were playing a slow blues we would play a slow blues every night. And, uh, well, two things. I, I, I didn't talk to him that much because I was afraid of saying something stupid. So, I, you know, I tried to kind of wait until he spoke to me. But we were at the airport one day and I said, Miles, I don't know what to play over the blues. I play so, I feel so corny. It was a really slow blues. And he said, he said, you couldn't play corny if you tried. So that, I mean, just gave me confidence. But then he said, just think of it in three. So if it's like the tempo is one, two, like really slow. If you think, so the triplets become like a waltz. And he said, if you think about the subdivisions, okay, which is yeah. something I guess pretty obvious, but I wasn't aware of that. So just like that little thing helped me a lot. Um, but then that night he played on the turnaround of the blues, he played something that I'd never heard him play before. It was like a double time Clifford Brownish kind of bebop thing that he wasn't using. So I got the gig tape from that night and I transcribed it. And uh, after my solo, I walked up to him. We were back. We were kind of standing in the back of the man. I, I said, Miles, I just tried to play something you played yesterday and I totally fucked it up because I didn't really get it. You know, and he laughed or whatever. But then the next night during that, song he came up to me and he played it again like right at me like here it is <laughs> check it out one more time so he was aware of things like that but like i said just where you placed it where you started that kind of, that becomes the art of controlling your language that's priceless that's absolutely yeah, priceless yeah. Awesome. All right. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> this is this is all good. So what happened after after this this, you know, after playing with Miles and stuff? So after Miles, uh, I just found myself back in New York. Um, you know, the Blue Note Records, I did three with them. Uh, and Matt was the producer. We were both young, inexperienced in the studio. And the first two records, we spent so much money, they gave us kind of carte blanche. So we didn't, we weren't paying attention to the fact that we should maybe be careful with our budget. Uh -oh. <laughs> so by the time the first two records were finished, we spent like 30000 on each recording because we flew people in and, you know, we were at the power station and, um, you know, we used the best guys, but we also could have cut corners certain in certain respects. Anyway, so, and the first two records were more like produced kind of, I hate to say Pat Metheny with saxophone, but they weren't technically blue note, like what you would equate with a blue note sound. Got it, got it, okay. They weren't standards, they weren't straight ahead. They were more, you know, we used vocals and some synthesizers and percussion and, 
So then the third record we made at that point, we realized we had to save some money. So we just did a live to two track jazz quartet record with that was with Joey Calderazzo, Bob Hurst and Jeff Watts. And to this day, people come up to me and say that's one of their favorite records of mine. So, you know, if, if, if I had a chance to do it again, I would probably have done that first record, the third record first. Yeah. Because we also got some flack from the critics, critics for saying that this doesn't sound like a Blue Note record and they didn't really hear me play the way I could play because I, you know, I wasn't, it wasn't about the saxophone. It was about the global picture mm. um, on those first two records. So anyway, so I did the three records for Blue Note and I just found myself in New York, just kind of back in the trenches. Um, I recorded one for Steeplechase, uh, a couple for a label called um, uh, Challenge out of, ne- out, of, out of the Netherlands, um, and then two for a record label called, um, I lost it. I did... Um, so Steeplechase, Challenge. Challenge. Uh, It'll come to me. Okay. But I did uh, two more records. So I did like five records as a leader after the Blue Note records. And, you know, in New York, just playing jazz and coming to Europe a lot to to tour as a sideman. Um, but also still having to do club dates to make money and, you know, do whatever you need to do to survive in New York. Um, and I had always loved coming to Paris. So there was this little seed in my mind that was planted that it would be a cool place to live because whenever I came to Europe you get the feeling that you're respected more as an artist yeah um and the majority of the money that I made playing creative music was made coming here and doing festivals and touring and Paris is really kind of like the center of Europe so it's a great like place to think of as a hub to move in and out of all the other countries um so I was uh 2003 I guess so I'd been in New York for over 10 years and like I said still having to do club dates and I was living in an apartment that was an illegal sublet and we got caught so I was gonna have to find another place to live and at that point it was always you know it's always traumatic to try to find a place to live in New York that isn't like super expensive that was back then yet alone now um and at the same time I got asked to join um a French band by it's called the Mouton Reunion Quartet and the bass player Francois uh, lived in New York. So I had been doing some planning with him and he had a band with his brother who lived in Paris. Um, so I find myself coming over to here, coming over to Paris even more to play with them. And at the s- same point where I needed an apartment, um, a friend of mine in Paris basically wrote me and said he's getting ready to move and if i wanted to he would just sign over the lease and i could have his apartment wow so i i got offered a gig and an apartment in paris right when i needed a place to to live and it's like the universe kind of just pointed me here it seems like uh, the universe I, i i'm just thinking to myself that the theme so far it's 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 the connections that you've made but it's also um how things just fell how things just fell into place for you yeah you know between like your relatives going to new orleans right and then mm-hmm. you going to that ho- and falling in love with that music and staying there for five years and then finishing your degree at loyola right and then and then getting to new york through that connection with matt pearson you know and then and then like the situation with miles and stuff like that you know and then and then staying in new york and and like five records and all this kind of stuff everything just seems to be it, it it seems like um I, I can't think of of the, the the cliche or whatever, but everything just seemed to kind of fall in place for you. Yeah, and of course I'm I'm just picking out the highlights. There are definitely some dark times and struggling times and all that stuff. Um which is part of everybody's life. You're gonna be up there are gonna be ups and downs. Yeah. But yeah, the major kind of signposts were things that were kind of just place there for me so i think you have to kind of just be ready and be open to signs that present themselves or maybe you know the the major ones were pretty obvious but sometimes the smaller ones you don't realize till after the fact so yeah um, 
I'm trying to learn to pay attention to even the smaller little instincts or uh, intuitions you might have. Um, but yeah, I've this, this theory that if you don't pay attention to some of the big signs, like if I wouldn't have moved to Paris, I think something negative would have happened because you're going against energy that's kind of leading you someplace. Yeah. I thought that if I didn't like it, I could always move back, but I didn't want to regret not taking the chance. Mm. Um, and I also think, you know, Liebman, um, he talks about how life kind of organizes itself in 12 year cycles and the importance of the number 12, 12 hours in a day, 12 months in a year, 12 notes in a schematic scale. Um, so if you think when you're one to 12, that's you're growing up to almost become a teenager. Adolescence starts at 13. Wow. Yeah. Oh 24. Gosh. Then young adulthood starts around 25 to 36 from 37 on you become an older, you know? Um, so wow, it's, it's kind of a, I mean, it's very general, but in, in, a global sense i think that's kind of true so i think every 10 or 12 years something's going to present itself um and i think like i've been here in paris almost 20 years and i think sometimes it's good to take a chance with your life before life forces you to do something you're not ready to do mm. So I sometimes think, am I going to just end up staying in this apartment forever? It's 20 years already. Maybe it's time to do something different before I get a phone call saying, you know, the landlord is going to sell the building and you have to find a place to live. Yeah. So be proactive instead of reactive. So um, I, don't, I don't mean to get that kind of. Uh, no, this is great. This is great. Esoteric, but. <laughs> No, it's a great analogy, and I'm and and it's it's uh it's not even an analogy. It's you know Lieb Liebman's thought, and then you're expanding upon that. I think that's very cool. So mm. you've been in Paris, right? And then you know you you have all these opportunities. Talk a little bit about that before we get to we dive into the book. Yeah, I came here as a result of joining that band and finding the apartment. And uh, for about ten years, I worked with them pretty regularly because they had a lot of uh, access to French kind of government money that funded some of their tours That's and great. you know each almost every little town in in france has a little cultural center so we were working quite a bit mm. but after 10 years it was time to do something different for them so uh i haven't been with them for a while but we're still you know in touch uh i started teaching at a school about uh, i think this is my 14th year it was called the american school of modern music and now we've switched. Uh, it's called EMEP, I M E P, which stands for the International Music Educators of Paris. Interesting. Okay. And at first, at first, I took the job just because I needed to. I needed to have my paperwork in order to be part of the French social system, which is pretty amazing. I mean, the taxes are higher here, but the health insurance, like I have health insurance now, which I could never afford in the states. Mm. Um, and being part of that, and there's a French unemployment system for artists that you have access to when you actually have your, it's the equivalency of a green card. Wow. So teaching at the school made me basically legal here. And uh, I'm teaching only two days a week, and it's a harmony, arranging, composition, improv class. And it's to all instruments. So it's not teaching mechanics of saxophone. Got it. So no private lessons which I kind of enjoy. Okay. So, I mean, I'll, st I'll still teach privately. People come to me occasionally, but not like one student over the course of 30 weeks a year, which would be a little overwhelming to me. Okay, interesting. So, yeah, yeah. so just teaching music instead of teaching saxophone. Cool. Um, yeah, so, and like I said, since Paris is kind of the center of Europe, um, it's pretty easy to get on a train and get to Germany uh, to Belgium, to Holland, to London, to, to parts of Italy, to Spain. Uh, and each one of those scenes is separate. So um, it's still difficult for me to go out and tour with my own band. But in each of these countries, I have a rhythm section that I play with 
or that has called me to join them. So I have these little kind of accounts. So every two or three months, I'm going out for three or four days. Um, and your schedule allows for that. That's the that's the cool thing. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, and it's, exactly. The school is good with me being able to, to not be there all the time. And I'm only at school two days a week, so it's not like I'm missing a lot when I'm gone. Yeah, yeah. You, you, um, can I ask something? You said each country is like a different scene. Can you talk that, mm -hmm. about that a little bit? Yeah, well, like, um, I've been playing um, in... Uh, we've, we've had a steady Monday night gig here in Paris. Uh since 2017 okay almost every monday since then i mean of course during the lockdown and blah 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 but we've but since i'm here all the time it's really difficult to play anywhere else in paris because people know that hit, they can come hear me on monday night for free so the club owners in the rest of the town don't want me to play there because they don't think nobody, anybody's gonna come oh. right oh that stinks yeah yeah so but I can go to London and play on the weekend because it's a completely different city. Yeah, yeah. Right? And if I played in London, say, I, like, I, I was just there two weeks ago, I could play in Germany, which or I'm going to Germany in a, a week or so. Whereas if I, I couldn't play in London two weeks and then take two weeks off and then come back, it's like, so I don't know if I'm being really clear. The fact that each country is different, there's no conf conflict between the club owners saying, well, you're just here, you're overexposed, so we're going to have to wait six months to have you back. Got it. Okay. Got yeah. it. Yeah. All right. Now that makes sense to me. All right. Cool. All right. So um, this is this is so interesting how things have evolved for you. I'm, I want to definitely make sure that we honor your time, too. Um, mm -hmm. What inspired you aside from gary campbell's teachings and stuff like that but how you know we come across the pandemic right lockdown um craziness is happening mm -hmm. so talk about the inspiration for the book the 360 okay. days to practice sure um my parents uh, you know we grew up in detroit but my parents lived near uh near las vegas in henderson nevada so i was there this is uh Christmas, the hol yeah, holidays, 2019, and it was New Year's Eve, and I was listening to a podcast by some Buddhist guy, um, I don't remember who it was now, and the subject was starting and finishing projects. So that planted some seed, obviously, in my subconscious, and I had been aware of people who were doing like 100 days of practice on Instagram or Facebook, or it could have been 100 days of something. It was just kind of like a hashtag trend for a while and i thought of doing that um but i wasn't really into the idea of, of posting a video every day um so anyway i woke up the next day so this is yeah so it was first day of 2020 and i said you know what what if i would just post an idea every day but instead of 100 100 days one idea a day for a whole year that's cool and it just, it, that's just how it started. I, I went into my notebook and just found the first idea that I thought was interesting and posted it with a little explanation. And what made it easy is I wasn't following any kind of plan. So I didn't have to plan out a year's worth of ideas in advance. It was just kind of what struck my fancy that day, something I'd been working on. Um, or something I found in my notebook. And then if I did find something in my notebook that needed a couple days to be developed, then that would at least have a structure for those three or four couple days. And then I would jump around to the next thing that kind of came up. And um, so this was three months before the pandemic even hit us, right? Because that was March of 2020. Yeah. So uh, it became a way of kind of spending at least a little time during the lockdown doing something that was kind of connecting with people. And while this was happening, everybody was telling me you should turn this stuff into a book. So that wasn't my initial thing wasn't to write a book. Um, but as it progressed, that's what happened. And um, a great saxophone player and friend of mine named Jeff Elwood who yes. is in California. Um, what he was doing is as I was posting them every day, he was entering them into finale. 
Okay. Because I was posting them by hand. So by the end of the year, I had actually kind of the template for the book to work from. So that saved me a huge amount of time. Oh, yeah. To not having not to have to enter everything into the computer. So uh, I didn't start immediately. And then I decided to start working on it. And then I realized that it would be a cool thing is if there were play along tracks to go with every idea. So people could actually hear what they sound like as opposed to just reading it, but not hearing yes. them in context. So that was time consuming, creating all the backing tracks and then recording the examples. Yes. But I'm glad I, I'm glad I did it because it adds something that I think is really helpful and useful. Uh, but then once I did the, all 365 of them, the idea of having to go through and edit and check for mistakes was really overwhelming. So I stopped for almost six months just to give it a, you know, give some space, give, yeah. it, space. give myself a break. Yeah. Miles Davis uh, and then I kind of, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, at some point I picked it up again and we'll just do it, you know, like just a, a chunk of it at a time. And still, I didn't have a publisher. I didn't know what I was going to do with it, but I just knew that at least I have to finish the idea. Uh, the idea of the book. Um, so um, the Michael Brecker practice book, practice notebooks was published by Sheer Music. Yeah. Which was incredible to see. And uh, going through it, I was completely amazed that one of the ideas had my name attached to it. So when Michael was making entries into his notebook, he would sometimes attribute whatever the idea was to the person who he got it from. So uh, that was a huge honor to have one of them attributed to my name. So yeah, <laughs> I, I ordered the book um, and Chuck Schur, who is the published published, the old owner of the company, he actually wrote me and said, Rick, I was going to send you a copy. I mean, he's such a cool guy. He was in, he said, I was going to send you a copy because your name is in the book. That's awesome. Um, so once again, the universe just kind of pointed me in this direction through Michael to this guy. And I said, well, Chuck, I'm not sure if you'd be interested in this, but I have a book. And I talked to him about the project project and he said, yes. Yeah. So I didn't have to really do any work to get, get a publisher. It came kind of easily. So um, yeah, that brings us to the fact that it, it was released on New Year's Day um, this year. So it was four years after I started it that it's now out in the world. Yeah. And while you're talking, what I'm going to do, and I know for some of you listening to the, um, to the podcast, you know, um, audio, you're not going to be able to see this. So I want you to check out the video. So this is, this is the book, 365 Days of Practice. And what's really cool about this, you've got some amazing endorsements, but also, um, like you mentioned, the playalongs and all that kind of thing are in here as we keep going on. Great picture, by the way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you, and you standing on the shoulders of giants, you know, right over here and, and, a, you know, huge thanks to Jeff Elwood, um, for doing this, but more importantly, um, those people that I know you're going to buy the book, we'll have the link in the show notes. Okay. Um, please read about this book and also please read about the practice method. I, I think this is super super important it's not about okay let me just start playing and oh i see a musical example let me just just do that read through um read through this and understand the um the thinking involved and you know the way to get the most bang for your buck in mm -hmm. going through this because um it, it's you know the, the 365 days that the postings that jeff did don't come until a little bit later and um they may not make sense to you or, you know, you won't get the most bang for your buck unless you, I, I feel, this is my own opinion, unless you, you know, go through and read through the practice uh, ideology. Yeah. Well, in, in putting the book together, um, yeah, the, the, the online project was just an idea a day, but when I started assembling the book, I realized that I need to explain how I developed a lot of these ideas. So yes. There's a whole chapter about the practice method that I got from Gary that goes into detail about how I work on basic things. And then that sheds light on the ideas that actually come in the body of the work. So thank you for that, because uh, it's really important that they absorb that 
method methodology um, before they go into the ideas themselves. Yeah, because, you know, it's funny, a lot of people have grown up using the Abersol books, but I can't, and I, and I hate to say this too, you know, Jamie's, Jamie's such a great guy, right? But mm -hmm. so many people say they don't read the verbiage. <laughs> they just <laughs> put the backing track on, right? And, and yeah. you know, and the thing is, he's got so much, a wealth of information. It's the same thing here, you know? Now, in, in myself looking at this, you know, I think the, this book is for a more advanced player. Someone who, uh, that's what I'm thinking. Am I, am I right when you, when you were, I mean, yes, we were just doing the posts and stuff like that, but what are your thoughts on that? Well, there's certainly a lot of things for the most more advanced players, but um, like the one you just clicked on. Right here, page 10. Number 24, that deals with just major scales and how to voice lead a 251. So Yeah, this is good. The, pra the practice method itself is for people of all levels. So it, it's, it, it helps you how to learn. It shows you how to learn just playing thirds in each key but it opens up into something that can be really complex. But there are definitely a lot of ideas that are just bebop-based ideas and deal with traditional language. Yeah. And that sheds light when you get later on in the book where I, some, I, I explain how I transform some of those ideas. Um, yeah, like right here, 24, 25, 26. These, it's a 251, and it starts off in 24... You know, um, it's just basic stuff. There's no extra, you know, um, um, extensions or anything like that. And then There's no extensions or no chromaticism. And then right. the 25 has some chromaticism and that added on the five chord. Right. And then 26 adds chromaticism to the resolution. So we yeah, have those are the, those couple pages are at the beginning are some of the most important, actually. Yeah. And this, this is how you develop, you, this is how you, you know, again, these are, these are exercises. And in doing these exercises, you're building your ears, you're building your technique, you're, you're building understanding of the language and stuff like that. And, and, I, and, and this is my own opinion. Like, it's not like to just like, okay, let me throw this out in the bandstand, you know. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, it's what can you do, you know, with this, understand the concepts and stuff like that. As well. And once again, on, on their website, um, you could download all the recorded examples. Got it. So there's a, link, there's a link on their website that takes you to them. So you could actually hear what these lines sound like over the chord progression. <clears throat> and that's how the, um, excuse me, like, so books nowadays don't come with CDs. It's usually, you know, usually there's a download link, um, mm -hmm. you know, in the book. And that's what you're talking about. They would. Uh, yeah. Yeah, find the download link and go to, to Share Music. I think it's sharemusic.com. But, mm -hmm. you know, again, those of you that are listening, just, you know, just watch this, this portion, uh, the video, you know, of the podcast and stuff like that. You'll get, a, you'll get a sneak peek into the book, you know, for sure. And you could see, like, the development of ideas and, um, yeah, just a wealth of information here. For sure. And you must feel like a proud papa. <laughs> <You know? laughs> now that this is, I'll stop the share at this point. You must feel like a proud papa, you know, at this point. Um, and, and this book wasn't, you know, wasn't like, okay, yeah, I'm going to do a book. It just like, all right, you know what? I, I got, again, this, this whole theme of the universe, you know, the universe giving you signs. That's what it really is. It's the universe giving you signs and you paid attention to those signs, small and, you know, small and big or whatever, and things, mm -hmm. it's not luck, it's just that, you know, you did the work, you did the hard work, and then things appeared, because you paid attention to the signs. Yeah, um, I feel really blessed in that respect, that a lot of things have been kind of shown and given to me, but you have to do the work, you have to be prepared, I think, so when those opportunities are presented you can actually deliver absolutely now <laughs> um, i'm going to honor your time so let me ask this question uh mm -hmm. any up uh, any other upcoming projects coming up for 2024 uh not under my own name i did do a record well i i have a quartet here in paris and we play every monday night and that band recorded an album called sacred hearts uh that has been out for about a uh, maybe two years now um so that's my latest recording and a year before that i did a big band recording with the south florida jazz orchestra called cheap thrills so those you can find you know on all the usual platforms um 
there's a French arranger here named Christophe Del Sasso, and he just arranged the music of three quartets for a 10 piece band. So there are three tenor players and we, sh we so we're all sharing, you know, it takes three of us to make one Michael Brecker. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's super fun to play all that music from that recording, but orchestrated. So we have some, some gigs coming up. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, and uh, nothing really else under my own name in terms of recording. Um, Got it. Or Got it. Projects. Um, but... Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was I was thinking though, the last couple of things I've done once again have been bigger produced kind of things. So uh, I was thinking of recording just a, a trio record with bass and drums playing standards, something we could just go in and record cheaply and just put out there and kind of just document my playing in that setting because I have not done anything like that in a while. And you know, that's cool. Now, yeah. now I've got to ask. Where, how can people, I know you said like these albums are available everywhere that you can find them, but, um, and before the podcast, we spoke about this, you don't have a website yet, mm -hmm. yet. Okay. We're going right. to say, <laughs> we're going to hold that to you. So that's another universe <laughs> sign. Um, but mm -hmm. where can people find you and perhaps, you know, um, yeah, just keep track of what's going on, you know, and, 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 you know, hear you and stuff like that. Where can they find you online? Yeah, well, it's 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 just my name on Facebook or Instagram at this point. Uh, and if you type in my my name on YouTube, all the new records come up. Uh, so a lot of that stuff you can just download and just listen to. Or if you want the actual thing, there are links that take you to the actual product, so you can own it. Um, are but you yeah, saying, I, I'm sorry. Are you saying do you have a YouTube channel or? Uh, I have, yeah, I have one, but I haven't really added that much content to it. But if you, if you type in just my name, all the, the recordings that I've done just come up just because different it. people have posted them. Um, but I definitely realize now that I have the book out and if I want to get a little bit more serious about things, just, uh, I guess I need a, a website at this point. <laughs> <laughs> and that's another way to, you mentioned doing the trio album of documenting your playing. The website is going to be awesome for you because it's going to not only allow people to have one central spot to, you know, buy the book, get the mm -hmm. recordings, all that kind of thing. But it also, thinking about it, it's also your own documentation of, you know, if there's ways to for that person to add links to all of your albums and stuff. Yeah. Your own documentation right there. I thought of the record label. No, it's, it was Palmetto Records. I did two records for Palmetto. There we go. <laughs> Finally came back to me. <laughs> And one thing, actually, I was thinking about doing, um, I don't know how difficult it is or whatever, but I was thinking about starting a Patreon page where I start uploading some content, content every week where I couldn't even just take one idea from the book and maybe go into a little bit more detail or something. So I might create a, a presence out there. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely. It's like a lesson. It would be, you know, a lesson per week or month or whatever the case may be. And, and yeah. Um, no, I think it's a great idea. It's definitely a great idea for sure. Well, listen again, Rick, <laughs> this, all the stuff that you shared <clears throat> and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the stories, the, the tips, the developing your own voice, you know, all these, these, these nuggets, these golden nuggets of information. I can't thank you enough so much, uh, you know, for, yeah. for your time and, and all that you've done and especially, you know, following the signs of the universe and, you know, following your heart and, 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 and going through all the things in your life, but also putting this book out for everybody to, to learn from you. I can't thank you enough. Thank you for and being here. Donna, thanks so much for asking me to, to, to do this. I had a, a great time and it's great meeting you in person. I've enjoyed all your stuff online, but it's nice to make the connect, connection, obviously, this way. That means so much to me. I, I can't yeah. thank you enough. Yeah. Thank you again. Thanks.